Okay, so we'll get started. So um, again, this, um, just like we said previously, this is all this material is uh, available through the Creative Commons license. It's available freely to redistribute it and it's all recorded. So <clears throat> we're gonna change gears a little bit right now. We've done a lot of um, um, enrichment analysis with both G Profiler and GSEA. And now we're gonna move into a new program and it's gonna be Cytoscape. And so we're gonna be um, representing data as networks. So this is network visualization analysis with Cytoscape. So this is the first part of this lecture. Um, I'm gonna go over um, some of the basics of network visualization. Um, and then I'm actually gonna go into details um, of Cytoscape. And um, we've changed it a little bit this year. So um, module three actually consists of three um, labs. And the first lab is a Cytoscape primer. Um, I will walk through Cytoscape and you guys are welcome to um, uh, use Cytoscape along with me. And I would also recommend just doing the primer because it just shows you some of the features of all the different stuff you can do with it with Cytoscape. So we're going to go over um, an introduction. We'll go over net, net, network basics. Uh, network visualization, and then how we're going to use it for network analysis, and then we'll also go through um, a demo. Okay, so the concept of, of networks, I guess, in general, this is not related to biology necessarily, um, but um, networks have been around for quite a lot. Uh, long time. And the concept is that, you know, everything is is connected. So the initial experiment was done, I think, in the 50s or the 60s. Um, and it was a social experiment done by Stanley, St Stanley Milgram. And what he did was, um, it's kind of like a chain letter, I guess. And um, what you had to do is you had a you had a letter and you had to send this letter to six, you know, everyone's had those, uh, maybe, maybe not. But I remember when I was a kid, those emails and those messages, you had to send to six people and you couldn't send it to the same person. So the concept was with uh, uh, Stanley Milgram was that you, um, you received a letter. If you received a letter and you knew somebody on that list, you were asked to send the, um, the letter back to their lab. And they were trying to figure out, you know, how socially connected people were. Um, and the, the conclusion that came from this, and you probably heard it, um, six degrees of separation. It was, it was also um, a game in the 80s. There was uh, six degrees of Kevin Bacon. You can connect any actor um, ultimately back to Kevin Bacon. Um, probably doesn't apply today. I don't know who the actor would be nowadays. Um, but the idea was that you can create these networks of people and that people are connected um, by shorter distance than you would you would think. Um, now, the same thing can be relevant in biology, right? In biology, we have lots of different networks that we can um, generate, um, and they help summarize um, globally what's happening, right? So there's networks everywhere. We have molecular networks, we have cell-cell communication networks, so two cells might communicate with each other. Within the nervous system, there's a network of signals that go from your brain to your hand. It's another type of network, um, and there are um, locations in the network that are more important than others, meaning that there are hubs within that network. And then also with, uh, you know, things like Facebook and Instagram, you have your massive social networks as well. So networks are actually everywhere. So why do we want to use networks in the context of biology? Um, so a picture is worth a thousand words, right? So we can actually represent a lot more things uh, when we represent it as a network, right? It reduces the complexity, right? It's more efficient than tables. We just did G profiler analysis and we did GSEA analysis and both of them generated tables. And yeah, tables are great for summarizing stuff, but there's more information that we can garner from that table um, that we can represent better within a network. So um, this is actually an example of um, a SARS-CoV-2 protein interaction network. And it was, um, uh, published in, in Nature in 2020. The reason why I used the SARS-CoV-2 network was because, you know, when the pandemic started, um, so much research, like, shifted focus and went into, like, SARS-CoV-2, um, into um, COVID and the pandemic. And so this is an example of um, multiple aspects of information that is represented in the network. Your red diamonds are actually viral proteins, and any connection between... Um, a protein and something else is a is an interaction that that protein has with something else. But there's also additional um, layers of information. The thickness of the edge 
is actually the strength of that association. So this was done with a proteomics pull down. And so um, the stronger that edge was, the more times you actually saw the connection between that gene and that protein. Um, and then there's also highlighted areas in yellow and in blue, which represent protein complexes or a specific biologic process. So, you know, we've represented a whole lot of information in a picture here where there's no way you can actually represent the same amount of information um, in a table. It also helps highlight um, certain aspects, right? You can easily see from this um, network um, which viral proteins are actually uh, more associated with, with more things, right? You can see that very, very easily. There are um, genes that are by themselves, but yet there are also genes that are highly, highly connected or hubs in this network. Okay, so <clears throat> why would we use network visualization for biological data? So in the picture before, I kind of demonstrated some of these things. It helps represent relationships um, of biological molecules. It's a lot easier to represent a lot of things um, in a picture, right? Where lists can be daunting and overwhelming. The second you represent that in a picture, you actually reduce some of that redundancy, much better than Excel. Um, and uh, you can also visualize multiple things at once. Uh, in the previous network, we had different types of uh, different types of proteins, we had different types of interactions, and then we also had layer on top of that different types of information that were summarized in that picture. Um, also, once we have that network, there are a lot of different programs that we can use now to analyze that network and find um, other aspects of it. Some of the things that we can look at, we can look at subnetworks. So if there's a particular gene that you're interested in, you can select that particular gene and just get its environment. You don't no longer have to look at the whole picture. Um, so it allows you to focus things um, a lot easier. Um, you can also look for paths between two, two genes, right? You have two genes of interest and you want to know how they're connected. Maybe they're not connected directly, but maybe there's some sort of path between them, maybe some pathway that can go from A to B. Um, and another thing we can look at is um, finding central nodes or hubs in the network. So, um, you know, the, the concept of network biology, um, it doesn't only apply to biology, obviously, but networks in general are everywhere. So, you know, in 2000 and Two, there was a massive, I'm, I'm not sure if this is the right year, but I think it was 2002, there was a massive blackout on the East Coast. And, you know, nobody had power in New York, in from New York all the way to Toronto. And what it turned out was, was there was, I think it was like a Homer Simpson type of moment. Somebody had spilled coffee at one of these hub transformers and it totally brought down the system on the Eastern seaboard. So, that exists in reality, but it also exists in the cell as well. You can have a gene that is highly connected to multiple processes, and then an individual mutation can actually bring down a whole set of functions, right? So in disease, we see hub proteins being more important than a general protein. Um, Gary also mentioned where, when we were looking at the, um, um, the autism data, that it turned out that it was one pathway or a few pathways that were um, interrupted by different genes, right? It was the actual pathway that was important, but the pathway was the hub, and it didn't matter which gene in that pathway got affected, but if the pathway got affected, all of a sudden you had different aspects of the diseases that were showing up. So when we represent our data as networks, there's a lot of things that we can now look at. So this is just a, just a, um, I guess, a few examples, um, a few pretty pictures. Um, another really nice thing about using um, networks is all of a sudden you can represent your data uh, in a pretty picture and everyone loves pretty picture. I know I do, right? So all of a sudden now you can represent things um, in different ways. So I just have here an example of, you know, detecting, so from a protein-protein interaction network, you can find um, complexes. So groups of proteins that work together to do a, a certain function. Um, we can also, uh, we're going to be demonstrating this a little bit later in the modules, I think tomorrow, but um, there's a picture of uh, gene mania, which helps uh, with gene function prediction. So you have a given set of genes and you know their function and you have a new gene that is also associated with those genes. You can now potentially infer its function from the known protein. So you can transfer that information from a known gene to an unknown gene. There are many other ways we can also um, um, use network analysis. So I mentioned this already, but we can look at subnetworks. So individual proteins that you're interested in, you can uh, focus in on them and look at its surrounding. 
Um, another thing people also like to do is motif analysis. So there are certain um, connections within the network that all have the same um, type of motif for the type of interactions. Um, another interesting thing that we can also do is network alignment. So between species, you can um, analyze um, a network in one species and compare it to another. Potentially in one species, there could be missing genes. And so you can infer what genes might be present and might not be there. Um, and also another thing that you can use networks for is um, um, pathway association. So just basic um, network um, information, right? So um, there are the two main aspects of a network are the node and the edge. And you can actually define them however you like, right? A node can be a person, a node can be a power station. But in our context, a node can be a gene, a node can be a protein, it can be a transcript, a drug, it can be anything, right? You define um, what the aspects of your network are. Um, and then once we have our node, we also have the connections between the nodes. So depending on what your node is, your edge is gonna be different. Your interaction, your relationship is gonna be different. So you can have a genetic interaction. So you can have a gene-gene network, or you can have a physical protein interaction with a protein-protein interaction network. You can have co-expression. So two genes that um, are expressed similarly might have an interaction between them. The reason why I specifically mention this is because um, we've done enrichment analysis and we're not gonna be creating traditional networks initially that are protein-protein interactions. We're actually gonna be creating um, networks that um, consist where each gene, sorry, which each, each node consists of a gene set and the edge between them are the related genes between them. And we'll go into that more in the second half of this lecture. So some of the, some of the few things that you can kind of use your network with is um, you can look at topological features. So that's when I you know, mentioned how your network is all connected. I have highlighted here a hub in our network, right? So a hub is something that is more connected than other things in the network. Um, and then within this network, we, I've also highlighted, you can have a cluster um, and you can also integrate different data types into this network, right? So this one over here has different shapes of nodes because they're different type of genes that are trying to highlight. And um, there's also different colors. So there's a lot of, um, I guess, graphical aspects that you can use um, in order to um, aid in your visualization. This is um, another exact example of visualization. Over here on the left, they're actually the exact same network every single time, but they're different ways of representing and overlaying the data. So in figure A, you have a hairball, right? So if somebody was looking at that, they'd find it difficult to see what was happening, but then all of a sudden in C, where you've divided things according to complexes and the stuff that interacts with those complexes, it's actually a lot simpler to understand what's happening. And finally in D, you've reduced some of that complexity and you've actually collapsed those complexes. So it, it depends on what you're trying to, what message you're trying to portray, what kind of network you show. I would argue that you should never show a hairball but if you go to a lot of publications, they show them a lot. Um, I, I guess it's more to show like, look at all of the data we have. We have a ton of data. Uh, it's not informative, but I'm gonna highlight what is important to this network, right? So the different ways of um, representing. Now, unfortunately networks are good, but there are things that are missing from the networks and the networks that we're gonna look at. And some of the things that are missing is dynamics, right? There's no way to, I mean, there could be ways to try and represent dynamics, but um, over time, it's not so easy. Another thing you're gonna notice that you can't represent is cellular location. Um, a network is not a, um, not a flow diagram. So uh, some of the apps will look at, they try and represent the context, right? Like cell nucleus and cell wall, but ultimately that's not the way the network is visualized inside Cytoscape. And it takes actually a lot of work by the person who's created the app in order to create that sort of structure. There are other programs that better represent those dynamics and those um, localizations a little bit better. So this was just basically, um, we went over how networks um, are useful for large data sets um, and um, how it's important to understand what your nodes are and how we're gonna define our nodes. Um, and there are many different me methods available for network analysis. Okay, so what are we gonna use for network and visualization? So hopefully everybody installed 
um, Cytoscape already, but um, Cytoscape is actually um, an open source visualization um, software that we use in order to um, represent networks. And these are just um, a few pictures that, you know, all of these were done uh, using Cytoscape. Uh, please know that any polished figure that I show, uh, very rarely is it generated directly from Cytoscape. There is a lot of manual work when it comes to laying out these pictures. And people see public published pictures and think that like that's just what's going to come out, but it never comes out like that. And even like we've tried to automate as much as the process as possible, but when it comes down to it, making those perfect, beautiful figures um, takes a lot, a lot of time. Um, so I'm just showing it like a few examples of different um, different figures you create. You don't actually have to be in the biological sphere to work with Cytoscape. Um, one of the one of the ones I've actually had to create a lot of people like um, publication networks. So I guess for grants, they want to show who they published with. Um, and so there's actually an app within Cytoscape called the social social network app. And it can grab your publication records and it create a publication network for your, your lab or for yourself. So there's a lot of different uses of Cytoscape that is not necessarily um, um, <clears throat> pathway network analysis. Um, it is a broad um, consortium of different um, companies that have worked over the years in order to generate um, Cytoscape. Um, it's been around since I'm, I'm gonna say 2001. Um, it was developed in Java, just like GSEA. So like, I think that nowadays it might not have been the choice of platform, but 20 years ago, um, it was something that was cross, um, it was a cross platform program that you can use. And that's why also why GSEA is also done in Java. There are new iterations of Cytoscape where they're trying to push this more to the web and being able to use it from the web. Um, and those are some developments that are coming down the pipeline. Some cool features, I guess, that you can have with inside Escape is that um, there are a whole bunch of automatic layouts that you, you guys will get to play around with. Um, you can manipulate your networks kind of just like a uh, um, like an Adobe Illustrator kind of thing. You can lay things out and it tries to help you um, make those figures with um, with additional um, attributes within the network, right? You can line things up and you can sort things out and change the, the layouts. Um, you can also filter and query your network. So if you're looking for an individual protein, if you're actually looking for an individual function, you can also search by that. Um, so it makes it easy to find things. Um, and then also there's the ability to load in networks. So there are multiple apps that you can use and they're different type of networks that you can load in. Um, one of the newer ones that's um, pretty cool Yes, and the second one over there is Index. Um, and the concept there is they've made a cloud system where if you've published a network, you can actually upload it to Index and then you can give somebody that um, Index key and they can actually download your network with all of the features that you've um, associated with that network as well as all of the layouts. Um, and you can even share things privately. So if you're working on a network and um, you're not ready to publish it, you're not ready to release it, you can um, upload that network privately and then send that network to your collaborators or send it to your PI, um, and they can actually then download it and play around with it and look through it. And it's a very good form of, or very good way to share networks. Some of the other apps that are available to pull in networks from Gmania, we're gonna be um, looking at that um, tomorrow, I think it is. Um, another one is Psychic. Psychic is basically, um, a um, consortium of lots of different consortiums that contain a lot of protein-protein interaction um, data. There's multiple uh, databases that are part of Psychic, and you can actually search for a protein to get all of its protein-protein interactions, and you can pull those networks in. Another beauty of Cytoscape is um, its ability to... Um, anybody can develop their own app for Cytoscape. So it is, it's an ecosystem. And currently there are something like 360 used, regularly used apps. And um, we're gonna actually be going through um, a few of the, these apps over the next few days um, of, um, it extends the actual usage of Cytoscape to many, many different frameworks. Um, so this is a, just a list of some of the apps that are available. Um, it's an active community. 
right? So I fortunately I can't get um, updated statistics because the some of the Google Analytics they no longer have, but on a daily basis, you know, it's ten thousand users. It's have over eighteen thousand downloads, and um, there are multiple active acts, three hundred sixty seven currently. Um, so these are just some of the top apps, and what I've kind of trying to highlight here. I mean, part I don't I don't love this picture because um, they don't normalize for length of time. So some of these apps are on the top apps because they've been around forever. An example of that is Bingo. Bingo, I think, was from like one of the first apps in Cytoscape. So although it's not used as often anymore, traditionally <clears throat> or um, historically it was, and so it's still in that top set of apps. And what I've tried to highlight are the apps that we're actually going to be looking at over the next few days. So, you know, we're going to be looking at the string app. Y files is a type of layout. It's um, actually a very good uh, layout algorithms that are within Cytoscape. Um, I think it comes, um, I don't think actually, no, it doesn't come standard with Cytoscape, but I think we asked you to install it during the pre-work. Um, we're also gonna be using um, enrichment map. Enrichment map is what we're gonna go into next. Gmania, Reactome. Um, I've highlighted SciRest. SciRest is actually an app that allows you to communicate with Cytoscape from anywhere. Um, and I use that from R all the time. Um, so a lot of the manual aspects of, of Cytoscape can get repetitive. So whatever, if you are an R user, I would highly recommend learning how to use the SciRest app because then you can actually talk directly with Cytoscape in a given pipeline and it can generate a lot of the work for you. And then you eventually have to go back and sit down with Cytoscape and create them. Um, two of the apps that we're not going to be going through, I just wanted to highlight. Uh, one of them is Klugo um, and it's, it's up there. It's another enrichment analysis tool um, and it has some very cool visualizations. Now, traditionally, Klugo only worked with Go, um, but thankfully, um, they've actually expanded that to a bunch of other pathway databases as well. Um, it's only available for human and mouse, but if you are working with human and mouse, I definitely recommend um, looking at it. Uh, another one of the apps, which I never actually heard of or I hadn't used, um, this is one called Cytohub. And the reason why I highlighted it is it's actually um, a relatively new app and highly cited. And it's a way of helping find important parts of your, your network. Um, and it offers some very cool visualizations as well. So when, if you are working with protein protein interaction networks, then I highly recommend checking that one out as well. So Cytoscape is a useful and a free software tool. Um, it is um, actively worked on. Uh, within the beta lab, there's actually a few people that are, are core developers on Cytoscape. And Cytoscape, from when we wrote the, uh, from when we did the pre-work to when we have are today, Cytoscape actually updated in that time. We were really hopeful that we would just send you 3.10, but it happened all close to that, that time. For those people working on Mac laptops, um, I would recommend using 3.10 um, because um, it was optimized for the M1 chip. So if you guys have those new chips, I know that a lot of people had, in general, there are a lot of issues, I guess, with M1 and M2 chips. So the 3.10 is definitely advisable. Um, another really good thing about Cytoscape, obviously, is that um, you have um, the ability of using all these additional third-party apps that help expand its uh, usefulness. Okay, so at this time, guys, I would recommend you open up Cytoscape and you can um, kind of go along with me. First, I'm just gonna go through some of the basics of Cytoscape. So Cytoscape is a Java, um, a Java application. Um, it is a little bit of a pig on memory. So when you have large networks, it does require a lot of memory. And if you, so if you are working with large networks, just keep that in mind um, because it can get frustrating if you have a computer that doesn't have the ability to use a lot of memory. Um, so on the left-hand side over here is, oh good, okay. Uh, on the left-hand side over here is, this is called the network, sorry, this is called the control panel. And on the control panel, you'll often see when you open up an app, a new tab will open up for that specific app over here. So it's important to know in the in the steps you guys are going to go through, we refer to these different panels. So if you know where it, each panel is, it makes it a little bit easier. So on the left-hand side, you have the control panel. On the bottom of the screen, you have the table panel. And on the right-hand side of the screen, you have the results panel. And the results panel is often closed. 
Um, but a lot of apps will put additional information into the results panel. So it's one you have to kind of be aware of. Um, there's the bird's eye view at the bottom, which can sometimes get in, get in the way over here. So you can expand and collapse it, but it's a, an easy way to navigate the larger network without um, having to zoom in and zoom out, right? So you can jump around with, by dragging this sort of square. Um, the network canvas is where most of the networks are and the network manager over here is usually the top tab and it allows you to jump between different networks. Um, on the top bar, um, I think I refer to it mostly as the top bar. Um, there's a bunch of different, um, a bunch of different things just, just so you know. Um, this over here opens and saves a network to Index. So Index is that cloud-based network sharing app. Um, you can open a session, you can save a session. Over here, these are shortcuts to importing a network or importing a table. So the one where it looks like a network, you're importing a network. And one where it looks like a table, you're importing data to annotate your network it with. Right, so that's, that's what tends to be in the table. You can zoom in and out. Um, this guy over here uh, will zoom to the whole network, whereas the one with the check mark will zoom to whatever you've selected. So, you know, when you have large networks, you can do a search for a given protein um, or, you, or a given term, and it might highlight multiple nodes. You can then select this check mark so that it focuses in on what you've selected. Um, the two arrows over here is to apply your preferred layout, which I think by default is set to like perfuse, um, perfuse layout. Um, the houses are neighbors, right? So I didn't introduce that concept, but within a network, um, anything that is connected to, so if I want to find, if I have a given node and I want to find all of the things that are connected to that node, I would select the node and then select all of its neighbors. So anything that is connected to a given object is its neighbors. And you can then do, if you want to expand your network even more, you can select a node, select its neighbors, and then select its neighbors of its neighbors, right? So that's how you kind of like grow your network if you're interested in a certain subnetwork. Um, and then um, the last one I'm going to highlight here is just this, this eyeball where if you want to focus on a certain part of the network, you can actually choose to hide or unhide nodes instead of creating a subnetwork, for example, but you can also create a subnetwork. Okay, so then now we're gonna, I guess if everyone has Cytoscape open, um, you can, in the top of your network bar over here, right, make sure that it's set to index. You can type in coronavirus. And what this is going to do is it's going to search the index um, database and it's going to give you a bunch of networks that are returned. And hopefully the third one down is this network, this IMEX network, um, coronavirus disease. And if you click on the green button, it should download it. And then, um, sorry, this is, <coughs> let me just do the same thing. So within Cytoscape, yeah, I guess it's still there. Um, over here in the network, I'm changing this to index. And I type coronavirus. Search. Oops, yes, sorry. Should know that, right? There you go. Um, and then click on it and it will download and it will open it up for me. Um, so over here, um, this is what the network kind of will look like, but over here I have um, its link to um, the web page. So this is actually available online. Technical difficulties, apparently. Anybody else? Did it load for anybody else? Okay, so it might be slightly different um, depending on the layout that was, um, right? Um, so this is, this is, uh, yeah, so, uh, there are also multiple options there, right? So then, then what we've done here now is we have like the whole network and you can now play around with it if you want. So um, one thing I guess I didn't mention um, how to do is um, visual styles, right? So there's a lot of information encapsulated in this network on the, in the control panel, you'll see there's a style tab. 
And the style tab allows you to set visual properties. And there's a lot of visual properties that you can set. And there's, there's nodes, there's edge, there's, there's network. So for example, for this network here, I can expand the fill color. And um, the fill color is actually representing the species that the data is coming from. And as you can see, they're, they're, <laughs> they didn't do this manually. They probably just um, had Cytoscape assign all these colors. Um, but you can actually go into it and change individual ones if you want. This is just fill color. Um, and there's even more parameters that aren't even represented here, right? So there's multiple things that you could have said, and the power of this is obviously great. The <laughs> problem is, is as, as a person, there's only so many pieces of information you'll actually be able to digest. So you, you can put too much information in here um, and not everything will be visual, like be able to be interpreted by the person. So yes, there's tons of things that you can set, but just know that there is a limit to what you can probably effectively visualize. Um, but yeah, there's still a lot of information visualized in these networks. So another, another aspect of this is that you can change the layout. So this is a basic profuse layout, but if I go to my, my layouts over here, um, another a really good one is the Y files organic layout. If I change that layout right now, it will lay it out slightly differently. Um, a few other layouts you can also try um, are attribute circle layout, right? There's a whole bunch of different things that that's just available by basically by, um, another good one is actually the cozy layout. This one takes a little bit of time though. Um, here, that one. But within the, um, within the primer, I guess you guys will have an opportunity to um, try out all these things. All right, so here's just a, a different, some different examples of the different layouts that you can try, right? So this is by default, it should be um, the profuse force corrected layout. Um, <coughs> I've, I've actually zoomed in on a subsection of this network. That's why it doesn't quite look the same. Here's an example of a, a circular layout. And um, within Cytoscape, there are actually different networks that you can load in. So I've demonstrated networks proper. Um, this is actually an example from Wiki Pathways. So within a pathway, there's often a flow. And this is what I mean by um, Cytoscape's not built necessarily to represent this flow, but there are some apps that try and do it. And this is an example of a Wiki Pathway. And within the Wiki Pathway, app, you can actually choose to import it as a pathway or import it as a network. And um, it works very, very nicely as a pathway, but you can't use any of the layouts within Cytoscape when you have it represented as a pathway, because um, then you'll lose this beautiful flow. Um, and there's other, there's other, I guess, aspects of the network analysis that you can't do once it's in this format, but there are reasons why people would want to see it as a beautiful, as an individual path that you can actually change the coloring on these nodes so you can show where your genes are affected within this given pathway. Um, and this one is wiki pathway, which is also, you can see it, it's, a, it's another option for downloading your networks. So before I go on to the next part of this lecture, are there any questions specifically about Cytoscape? So now we're going to go into specific a specific bunch of apps um, that we use in Cytoscape, and we're going to talk about enrichment maps. And um, over here, I just have like um, a few icons, I guess, a few icons of the different apps that we're going to be using today. Um, but the main one is enrichment map, and it's a Cytoscape plugin. Let me just go here. Okay, so hopefully um, by the end of this lecture, you will understand how to transform your G profiler GSEA and other enrichment algorithms to a network. Okay, so right now we've done module two and we've generated a whole bunch of files and they're all tables. And um, we want now to take those tables and represent them in a different format that it's easier to analyze them. So we wanna understand the difference between a network and an enrichment map. An enrichment map is a type of network that we are going to define. So as I just said, um, our results from um, lab two looks like this. These are the tables um, that, <clears throat> um, that were the list of pathways that were enriched for um, the two different scenarios that we're looking at. Um, but when it comes down to it, there's a lot of redundancy in these lists. And 
uh, if you end up looking at a list, you're going to just like focus in on one aspect instead of looking at the results in general. So, uh, so in general, what we started with is that we we've had a set of experimental data that is either as a rank file or as a thresholded list, and we've given it a bunch of pathways that we want to find out um, whether or not our genes are enriched in those pathways and um, the result of that is another table with our enrichment results and each pathway is associated with um, an enrichment set, uh, sorry, an enrichment score, right? So um, we've done G-Profiler and we've done GSCA um, and we've, with both G-Profiler and GSCA, we have the ability to generate um, two different subsets or as many subsets as we want because it could also be a cluster type of analysis, um, but we've taken our range list, whether it's thresholded or not, um, we've run it through pathway analysis and we've generated um, um, emission results for condition A, condition B, upregulated, downregulated disease versus control. So now we've also talked about networks and the networks we've talked about are protein-protein interaction networks or gene-gene interaction networks where each node is an individual gene. but we our results actually are tables of pathways and not tables of genes yes each pathway is associated with a bunch of genes uh, but they're not individual genes they're, they're a group of genes so what we're going to do is what we're going to do is we're going to create an enrichment map now an enrichment map is a network where each node is a pathway and the number of genes that two pathways have in common are the connection between those nodes or those pathways Right, so um, we have a we have a given pathway or gene set which is a node. The size of that uh, node can be the size of that pathway. It doesn't have to be, um, but I think by default that's what the image map does. And the color indicates the direction and the strength of its association with the phenotype. Right, so in this context, um, we were in our lab we were doing um, immunoreactive versus uh, mesenchymal. So I think um, blue in this context is the immunoreactive. They were the negative in our ranked list. And the red is the mesenchymal subset, right? So over here, we have two different sets of pathways. One's associated with the mesenchymal set and the other one's associated with the immunoreactive. But in a traditional um, control, sorry, disease versus control, your red would be upregulated in disease and your blue would be downregulated in disease. Um, now, the connection between our nodes is the amount of overlap between those two gene sets. Now, the, the reason why we do this is inherently the pathway databases are highly redundant. Even if you just look at Go, which represents a hierarchical process, right? So in Go, every term is actually very related to a lot of other terms. So you could be, your top 10 lists could all be referring to the exact same pathway. And that's like, an overload of information you don't want. You want it simplified, you want to summarize it. And so the way we do this is we take our enrichment results and we create a network from it. So how are we doing this overlap? So just briefly so you understand, um, by D okay, in, within the enrichment map um, app, you actually don't need to know these um, details, but the way it's working is there's, there's three different metrics you can use in order to connect your pathways. Um, there are, there's the jacquard, overlap, there's the um, the overlap coefficient, and there's also um, the combined coefficient. So I think generally by default, we use the combined, but the way the nodes are connected is you um, calculate the overlap between two gene sets, and then you're dividing it by either the minimum or the union of both of these sets. And depending on which, um, which enrichment analysis you're using, um, you might want to use a different type of connectivity and you can play around with those within the enrichment map app, which you're going to get to. Um, so typical output here, we've gone from, so everyone, I don't know if everyone opened up the tables that were associated with GSEA or with G profiler. GSEA generates a lot of tables. There's actually two important tables in there, but it, it generates a lot of results, which can be a little bit overwhelming. But generally you have two main tables, which represent your upregulated and your downregulated um, results. And so these are the two tables we're gonna be giving in Richmond Map as well as a few other, um, a few other information. Um, and then we're gonna translate um, this network 
into, um, sorry, we can translate this table into a network. And so this is the typical output from the enrichment map. Um, and so now I'm just gonna briefly go over just um, some few like quick, I guess, examples of how we can use enrichment map. So um, a basic example uh, is a single enrichment case where you have um, treatment versus control. Um, so in this context was in, um, these were cells that were treated with estrogen and cells that were not were treated with estrogen after 12 hours and 24 hours, um, ran a basic enrichment map, sorry, basic enrichment analysis to generate a basic enrichment result. This is actually one of the first analyses that we did. And again, I said it already before, enrichment map will not generate this picture. It will generate um, a more complicated picture, which then you kind of have to like work through and move things around to generate um, a figure like this, right? So we have circles around um, functions um, that are related to each other. These, there's a, an app we use called Auto Annotate that helps with calculating what those um, summaries should be, but it's not perfect. The way it works is um, it basically grabs the names of all of the nodes in a given cluster. Now it, it uses a clustering algorithm to calculate those clusters and then it grabs all the names of them and it looks at the words in the names and it tries to guess um, what the best description for that cluster is. And so a lot of them unfortunately uh, end up not being correct or not the best words you can use. So we recommend that like, this is kind of like where you start from. You're like, you're encouraged to look at the sets in each one of these clusters and devise your own um, summary for it. But we're just, it's just kind of in the process trying to help, right? So you can zoom in on an individual cluster here, right? And so you can see that this one microtubule um, cytoskeleton, right? You can actually look at the individual um, annotations on the nodes given for this cluster. So this actually is a decent um, summarization of this subcluster. So another example of um, a use case for Cytoscape is um, using multiple um, time points, right? So uh, the first one, we were just using an individual time point, which was the 12 hours. This data set actually consisted of multiple time points for 12 hours and 24 hours. And originally the way Cytoscape, sorry, originally the way the enrichment map was um, structured was we took advantage of multiple features in order to encapsulate more information. So in this network, the inside of the node is actually um, 12 hours and the outside of the node is 24 hours. So you can actually highlight differences um, between these two situations based on the presence and the absence of that enrichment, right? Because you're trying to see what's changing between the 12 hour scenario and the 24 hour scenario. So when you run enrichment maps with two data sets, um, it takes use of this, um, those two visualizations. Since uh, this part was um, developed, you can actually now, uh, wait, before I go into that, I'm just going to say, so another feature of the enrichment map is that you can delve into the details of an individual pathway, right? So you have expression associated with um, your analysis and your ranks, and you can load this expression file in to Cytoscape when you create your enrichment map so that when you click on an individual node, you can actually see the differential expression um, of, in, of individual genes within that pathway. So what I'm highlighting over here, sorry, where's my mouse? Highlighting over here is that these pathways over here where there is no expression at 12 weeks, sorry, 12 hours, but there is expression at 24 hours, you can see a clear difference in the expression patterns between your 12 hours and 24 hours. And so, oops, sorry, wait, what did I do? Um, so enrichment map offers not only a summarization of your global pathway analysis, but then you can also use it as a tool to delve into the details of individual pathways. And you know, if there's a, there's a subset of your network that's of interest, you can highlight it and then actually look at the genes that are affected. Another thing that you'll see when you do the lab, um, it can also highlight leading edge um, analysis, right? So when you ran GSCA, um, there was, I don't know if you had a chance to look at your, your results, you'll see that there was a column called core enrichment associated with each pathway. And um, basically the 
enrichment score as it's calculated, that it reaches a peak at a point, and that's called your leading edge. So any genes that are to the left of that peak are considered the important genes. Those are the genes that are driving the enrichment. So um, when you click on an individual node within the enrichment map, you, it will actually highlight your leading edge genes. And those aren't necessarily more important, but sometimes it's, it's, it's interesting to look at those specific drivers of those pathways. And so that's another feature we have here. So another thing which was mentioned before um, a few times uh, in multiple talks is the concept of um, um, a post analysis. So you can run a whole pathway analysis and maybe you have um, additional experiments that you wanna pull in, right? So it could be microRNAs, it could be drugs, it could be transcription factors, but you could have an individual transcription factor that you're interested in, or you could have, uh, or you wanna be interested in a certain type of drug that might affect some of these pathways. So what I have highlighted over here is the concept of the, um, the post analysis. So this is, this is a network and um, what we're highlighting here are um, um, the targets of an individual micro RNA that we know is associated with this, um, with this uh, hemopoietic uh, progression set, uh, stem cell. And so um, over here, we've done a post analysis where all of the targets of this micro RNA are highlighted. There's actually quite a few um, that affect it, but it does not only have to be micro RNAs. And there's the ability within Cytoscape, or sorry, within Enrichment Map, to um, if you know what you're looking for, you can look for a specific example like this MER125. Um, but there's also a the ability to do a, a broad analysis. So you can actually grab in all the drugs and say, no, I want to see um, drugs that are um, that target my network um, with a given statistic with a given threshold, and it will actually list a bunch of drugs that potentially could be uh, important to your network. Um, and lastly. Um, Another beauty, uh, uh, Gary already showed this picture, but another nice thing about enrichment map is that you can actually, it is not limited to just two data sets. There's no actual uh, uh, limit or no actual threshold on the number of data sets you can use. So you can, you can put in here 20, 50, 100. The problem is, is <laughs> this picture is very, very nice because it seems there's very, there's a large division which pathways are affected by your data. Um, but often you can have clusters like over here where there are functions that um, hit multiple data, data sets, but there still is the ability to put in as many data sets as you want. It just becomes a little bit more difficult when you're trying to visualize it, um, especially for noisier data sets. So um, I've mentioned a few of these, but um, so within the enrichment map um, app over here in the control panel is the main uh, window you are gonna be using in order to um, uh, look at your network. There are a few um, slider bars that you can actually use over here, which can help uh, reduce the reduce the um, connectivity in your network, or also reduce the number of nodes returned in your network. So you can create your enrichment map, but then feel like there's just too many hits there. So you can actually reduce the p value, sorry, p value or q value. Q value being your corrected p value. Oops, uh, I don't know why it does that. Um, and you can also play around with the connectivity. Um, to see if like you can separate your nodes a little bit a little bit more over here in the bottom part with the heat maps that I showed previously. So clicking on an individual node, um, you can see all the genes and their ranks associated with them. Um, and then, as I mentioned before, if you select an individual node and your analysis was done in GSCA, this is important. If your analysis was not done in GSCA, then you're not gonna be able to get this information. This is something specific to GSCA, the leading edge. And it also is specific to an individual node. If you select a cluster, you will not see this highlighting over here. But this is what I mean by for this given cluster that, sorry, for this given node that I've selected, um, these highlighted genes are the ones that are part of the leading edge. So um, a few other um, apps we're going to be looking at are um, the auto annotate app. The concept of this app is once you've created your, um, your pathway enrichment results, um, it's, um, we want to be able to annotate um, clusters within the network. And what auto annotate does is first it uses another app called Cluster Maker and it clusters your network. Um, and then for each cluster, it uses another app called WordCloud where it tries to guess um, what 
the best annotation is for that network. And as I said, it's basically, it takes all of the words that are associated with that cluster. It counts the words for that cluster as well as the network. And it tries to normalize to certain um, words that are very common in the network and highlight the unique words of that network. And what this does is it clusters the network, it generates these clusters and it tries to generate these labels. Um, and over here, I'm just showing you the raw um, labels that is calculated for just this subset of the network. As you can see, the labels are, um, the size of the label is actually um, proportional to the size of the cluster. Now, um, I always change that so that it has them all the same size. Uh, people see a network and they see large clusters and they assume that the cluster is important. Um, but the size of the network does not actually indicate importance at all. It just means that that process is actually very well annotated in the databases. Um, often you'll have singular nodes that might be more interesting to you because they represent processes that might be more associate more more associated with whatever you're studying. But you you have to know that like the size of the cluster does not indicate importance. And I find that people have a lot a hard time. Um, I think like just by human nature, I have a hard time um, ignoring the size of the, the cluster um, because size often indicates importance, but in this context, it doesn't. Um, and that's why there's kind of, um, I don't know why it's doing the double. Okay, so this is just a, um, just a screenshot of what, these are all the different clusters that um, are, uh, these are all the clusters that are generated for this network and you can actually click on an individual one you can rename it you can change the name and as i said before there is no requirement to keep the name that it is guessed often it will not be the best representation of that network but hopefully it's giving you a clue or it's giving you um, an idea of what you think that network should be called um, one other thing that we can do within um, um, within uh, enrich map as well as you can also collapse those clusters so um, as i said the cluster the size of the cluster is not important um, often it represents very well annotated um, features or functions within the pathway database so you can actually reduce the uh, complexity of your network by collapsing each one of those clusters and this is an example of um, a summary of actually a subset of that network where the clusters are collapsed